All right. Hello. Salam Adab. Namaste, everyone. Uh, it's our uh, good day for you know having three big scholars uh, touching upon this roughly same issue of gender, minorities, biases, privilege, as well as marginalization. Marginalization, and we have Professor Ashwini Tambe, Professor Sonali Desai, and Professor Rakesh Basan. Uh, the main speaker is Professor Desai, who is a distinguished university professor at University of Maryland, and she also has a joint uh, appointment at Delhi Center of Data Collection and you know that kind of thing. And Professor Ashwini Tembe from George University um, uh, is going to introduce her as well as uh, put the theme uh, rolling so that you know. Professor Desai can take over. And after at the end of Professor Desai's uh, talk, Professor Rakesh Basan from Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, is going to do concluding remarks. And after their talk, uh, there will be question and answer session as usual, which will be moderated by our colleague, Dr. Rafat Hussain. Uh, so I invite Professor Ashwini Tambe. Uh, to take this start. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Razioddin, for this invitation to speak. And my compliments again to you and to members of the Indian Diaspora Washington DC Metro for this excellent series that you have curated for the last several uh, months, it looks like. I've watched some of the videos. And again, it takes a lot of time to put together such events. So I appreciate it. And I'm glad that you have the videos available. Um, so the topic we've been asked to explore today is broadly the challenges faced by Indian women with respect to education, gender, and tradition. And specifically, you've asked us to think about inequalities related to um, uh, religion. Um, there are three speakers. Dr. Sonal De Desai, as you just mentioned, will be speaking for 30 minutes, and Dr. Rakesh Basant, who will comment on her presentation. Um, I'll be introducing both of them and also making some general remarks at the beginning. Uh, Dr. Desai stressed in several emails this week that she wanted me to share some of my own work. Um, I won't go too deeply into it, uh, but I will draw on some of the points of connection between it and the talk that uh, Dr. Desai has very kindly shared with us in advance. So let me quickly say a few words about Dr. Desai. Um, Dr. Sonal De Desai is a distinguished university professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Maryland. She's a demographer whose work deals primarily with social transformation and its impact on the lives of individuals. Her specific focus is on education, employment, and maternal and child health. I met her several years ago when I was a graduate student doing uh, my own um, concentration in gender studies at the University of Maryland. And I recall the excitement that she exhibited when she was a guest lecturer in one of the classes I was taking. And then I went on to also become a professor at the University of Maryland. And I will share that the excitement has not waned. She still has that glow in her eyes, that gleam of that sparkle <laughs> whenever she talks about her work, which is wonderful. She leads the India Human Development Survey, uh, which uh, covers over 40,000 households. It's the only national panel survey in India, and it provides a really rich resource for studying the transformations uh, in Indian society in the 20th century. And more recently, she and her colleagues at the NDIC have carried out telephone surveys on COVID and the experiences of the pandemic in the Delhi National Capital Region. Among her honors, she's been recently elected as president of the Population Association of America for 2022. And she serves on the editorial board of the journal Population and Development Review. Um, we will have Dr. Rakesh Basant, who will speak after her. I'll say a few words about him. He's a professor of economics at the Indian Institute of Man Management in Ahmedabad. His teaching and research interests include entrepreneurial business models and public policy, firm strategy, innovation, and uh, IPRs. He importantly was the mem a member of the Indian Prime Minister's high level committee, uh, the Sachar committee that wrote a report on social, economic and educational conditions of Muslims in India in 2006. 
And um, that's what uh, I think we will uh, look forward to hearing from him about specifically this topic. A part of his current research also focuses on issues relating to caste and religion in India. His three most uh, recent publications are The Black Box, uh, a book on innovation and public policy in India, which is out in two days. So congratulations, Dr. Basant. And um, uh, uh, an article in the Journal of Emerging Market Finance this year, which is focused on venture capital and private equity firms. And then in 2019, an article in the Journal of Development Studies, which focuses on quota-based affirmative action in higher education, the impact on OBCs in India. Really excited to hear both of you um, uh, speak on the topic of persistent inequalities in education. Um, so a little bit about myself. I'm a scholar of transnational South Asian history, and I focus on the relationship between sexuality, law, and gender. I wear special, uh, several uh, professional hats. I'm a professor of history and director of women, gender, and sexuality studies at George Washington University. This is a new position that I began two weeks ago. Before that, I was professor and interim chair of my department at the University of Maryland, um, uh, College Park. I'm also the editorial director of the journal Feminist Studies, which is the oldest peer-reviewed journal of interdisciplinary women's studies scholarship in the United States. My most recent uh, book, um, Defining Girlhood in India, a transnational approach to sexual maturity laws, um, is a book that I think is of relevance uh, to the material that Dr. Desai is going to present today. Um, this is a book that came out in 2019, and it offers a history of the expansion of the experience and idea of ch childhood and specifically girlhood in India across 11 decades, uh, from the early, early 20th century to the present. So some of you may be aware that um, the age of marriage uh, experienced a, a, a steep rise over the course of the 20th century. At the beginning of the 20th century, the legal age of marriage was 12, and by the end of the century, it was 18. Uh, so the question that I pose in the book is what happened? What explains these shifts? And some of the things that I look at uh, include ideas and concepts and how they travel. And one of the concepts I look at is adolescence. Um, I, I look at the emergence of the idea of adolescence. So adolescence uh, has been defined by psychologists as a phase between childhood and adulthood when a person is legally a child, but preparing for adulthood. It implies uh, uh, the detachment of physiological maturity from mental maturity. So people assume that um, in that age range of broadly um, 12 to 18 years, people are perhaps physiologically maturing um, and capable of sexual activity, but not necessarily uh, emotionally ready for it. I look at how this concept emerged and traveled to Indian uh, settings and specifically to um, in, in journals related to sexology, education, social work. And one of the claims I make is that the idea itself is very recent. Um, but it does explain some of the expansion and legal justifications uh, for raising the age of marriage. I also argue that the expansion of girlhood um, as a special life phase has um, paradoxically also meant the gathering force of protectionist parental control. Um, uh, so my book is complicated in its argument and it doesn't say that everything has been progressively getting better. In fact, one of the puzzles I grapple with is how the efforts to protect girls can actually be laden with the risk of disciplining girls, of inculcating dependence, and producing powerlessness. So for instance, I note that um, the very first reformist measures to raise the age of marriage uh, were motivated by the goal of protection. Uh, the goal was to ensure that parents did not arrange girls' marriages too early. But however, raising the legal age has actually enabled parents to dictate girls' sexual practices for longer. And many parents, in fact, um, use child marriage law to prosecute uh, 
people who um, they disapprove of. So uh, parents have declared void, legally void marriages that they refuse to accept. And most often those are intercaste or interreligious marriages. And if one takes into account how frequently elopement cases are taken up under the Child Marriage Restraint Act, um, many uh, feminists in India today argue that in fact, raising the age of marriage and sexual consent has frequently decreased girls' control over their sexual lives. So uh, it's a, as I said, it's a complicated argument. And my goal is to distinguish the impulse to shelter girls from the impulse to uh, protect and enforce sexual control over them. I want to make clear the distinction between the two and guard against the latter. So on the one hand, I think many would agree that it's important for girls not to be forced into early marriage, into domestic work, into motherhood early. Uh, but at the same time, we need to make sure that the laws that are in place don't prevent girls from pursuing sexual decisions independent of their community and their parents' wishes. Um, one thing that I look at specifically is the actual meanings associated with girlhood. Um, girlhood is um, uh, you know, typically associated with playfulness, innocence, um, being able to um, uh, you know, uh, uh, enjoy a certain kind of carefree, uh, care carefreeness, freedom from the responsibility of reproduction. Uh, but it's also very um, typically centered the, con con the idea of vulnerability, right? The, the idea of vulnerability is baked into the concept of girlhood. And so in my book, I look at various moments in which vulnerability as a feature creates problems because we imagine, because this figure of the vulnerable girl has so much e emotive charge, right? It's, 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 it's easily used for various uh, political ends. And often those ends don't necessarily serve girls' interests. Um, so that broadly is what my uh, book is about. Um, and now let me speak a bit about the points of connection with Dr. Desai's talk, which you're about to hear in a few moments. Um, there's one point that I found especially important that I'll ask you to listen for. Um, Dr. Desai notes that there is a steep drop off in school enrollment levels for girls between two age cohorts, between the age cohort of eight to 11 and the age cohort of 15 to 18. Those are the two cohorts that her study has focused on. And she notes that enrollment percentages for Muslim girls drop the most steeply. So to 56% enrollment in the age cohort 15 to 18, compared to 99% enrollment in the age cohort eight to 11 years. And this is a steeper drop than that which is found among Adivasi, Dalit and OBC groups. Uh, so I think that's something that we really need to sit with and grapple with and ask, you know, what are the possible reasons? I'm just going to speculate on a few before I turn it over to Dr. Desai. So the there are several reasons, but the first thing to note, of course, is that in this shift between the age cohorts, 8 to 11 and 15 to 18, we see that, we imagine that the, the, a, th a particular threshold, and that is the threshold of puberty, has been crossed. And uh, in many cases, um, puberty signals readiness for marriage, and that is really the point that I have uh, explored in my book. Um, how is it that the idea that marriage was, was necessary soon after puberty became less and less powerful uh, over the course of the 20th century. Now that is not to say that it has gone away, but I think it's important to note that this threshold um, is, is enormously significant in the lives of girls. It has life-changing consequences. Um, so first of all, girls' labor is suddenly seen as more valuable in the home um, and uh, you know, uh, often girls are kept at home in order to assist with domestic activities. And this is a point that I cannot sort of stress enough because, uh, you know, we frequently just take for granted the domestic work that girls do. It's something that's compulsory and it's expected from them at a very young age. Um, so, you know, you could go to a talk focused on child labor and nobody will 
mention the domestic work that girls do because we always assume when we say child labor, we're talking about the formal workforce and mm -hmm. it's typically boys working in factories, right? But the fact that girls are expected from a very young age to contribute to um, household work is not something that is counted or taken seriously and its effects on their life chances. Secondly, um, the question of mobility. Um, and I think your speaker, Latika Gupta, had some really interesting things to say about this. So I'm not going to sort of repeat them, but I'll, high, I'll sort of stress one point, which is that in going to school, there is the potential threat because girls are going outside the home, traveling through public spaces and to a, 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 a new site. So it's not only the people and the ideas they encounter in school, but also the fact of getting to school. And that, um, in, it, you know, after puberty, girls are suddenly framed as more vulnerable to being attacked. Um, and that then induces new forms of protection that are supposedly in girls' interests, but usually serve the interests of parents. Uh, and the interests of parents has uh, historically been to preserve uh, religion, caste, and subcaste boundaries, right? Parental control over girls' marriage choices. Um, and so the threat that girls can meet people who are not within those prescribed uh, uh, communities uh, is much greater. And um, finally, I think the, the reason for the drop-off could actually obviously be marriage itself, that girls are being married and parents are often seeking to dictate who the girl marries, and it's easier to do so when girls are younger than uh, as they grow, um, you know, as, uh, as they advance in age. So um, I'll, I'll just leave you with those thoughts before I um, uh, turn it over to Dr. Desai. I think one point that I want to just make is that, um, you know, about the idea of adolescence, you know, we may take for granted in urban middle class and upper class contexts that um, this experience of adolescence is something that all should have, but actually it is enormously uh, determined by one's class position, caste position, one's religious uh, background. Um, and in fact, it's important to note that many Indian languages don't even have a word for at the adolescent. Right, for somebody who is in that age group between te uh, 12 and 18. Um, you know, there are words that refer to youth, such as, you know, yuva, uh, or there is the word kanya, I'm drawing on Sanskrit here. Uh, there's kumar and kumarika, but there's nothing that quite connotes this idea that's a thoroughly modern one of an age range in which, um, People are experimenting and getting prepared for adulthood, um, and they're not quite adults. And even the term kanya, which translates as uh, virgin, implies a certain relationship to marriage and sexual activity. It sort of, uh, again, under underlines the powerful role that compulsory marriage plays in um, defining um, girls' um, uh, life chances. So let me stop there and I'll turn it over now to Dr. Desai, Sonaldi Desai. Um, and uh, thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Professor Tambe. Uh, appreciate uh, your very kind words and a great uh, uh, introduction to this topic. Let me start out by making a connection between what Professor Tambe talked about and the where I would like to sort of see this discussion move forward as I kind of make my presentation. Uh, Ashwini talked about adolescence as an age of innocence, an innocence that should receive protection from the family and encouragement and a space to grow. But when the family doesn't, okay, often what we expect is that the schools and the society will provide that space. And what I'd like to sort of take us through is the fact that the same children who may not be receiving the protection and care from their family uh, are also the children who are not receiving uh, the supportive and nurturing environment in school that they have right to expect from all of us. It's true for boys, it's true for girls, it's true for a variety of social groups, uh, but it is a challenge 
that uh, the society must grapple with somehow. Let me start by sharing my slides. Give me a second. Can I just confirm that you can see my slides? Yes, yes, I can, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, let me begin by thanking my colleagues, uh, both at University of Maryland and uh, at National Council of Applied Economic Research. I'm particularly grateful that we have Abu Saleh Sharif here on the call today, because some of this work began in partnership with him and, um, you know, all the credit for this work goes to him, the blame stays with me or um, vice versa, given that Sharif and I are good friends. <laughs> but mm, 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 let me kind of uh, walk you through some of the uh, statistical data and then we can kind of think about what it implies for a longer term uh, social transformation project. Now, one of the things that we have talked about is uh, in the Indian context is that Indian middle class is growing. It's like this uh, sort of iconic image that uh, shows up in all the world discourse. And yet, I think it's important for us to remember that the growth of middle class in Western nations was very different from growth of middle class in India and other parts of South Asia. Whereas in uh, Western countries, the middle class growth coincided with um, a transformation uh, of, of farmers into manufacturing, increasing unionization, and increasing income for skilled blue collar work. In India, it has been largely associated with incomes of white collar workers. Okay. Uh, let me show you some statistics here from National Sample Survey. And as you can see, um, basically, it's the share of the income that was, um, or share of household consumption uh, that belongs to farm households has steadily declined because the number of farmers has dropped, their incomes have stagnated, whereas the share of income that is available to the professional households uh, has steadily increased. Um, um, and we can see that in several different statistics. First thing is, uh, just to look at the same um, data from National Sample Survey between 1983 and 2012, uh, what we see is that um, the 1983 is red bars, 2012 are orange bars. And what you can see is that the most of the income growth uh, is concentrated in the households which classify themselves as professionals, managers, uh, lower professionals, clerical workers, um, teachers, etc. Okay. In spite of the fact, though, that they have experienced the most income growth, the number of people in this category, okay, which is basically the graph on the right hand side on the screen. Okay, uh, shows very little increase. Okay. So basically what we are seeing is, we are seeing a growth of people who classify as professionals, but at the same time, job opportunities in those categories have really not grown. Um, simultaneously, we have also seen a tremendous expansion uh, of education for both men and women. Uh, the number of people who are illiterate among men has dropped sharply between 1983 and 2012. So has it among the women. Okay? And uh, for men, the education growth has been sort of focused largely on uh, secondary school and beyond. For women, uh, there is also growth in middle school, secondary school, and so on. Okay? So we have rising education. We have increasing returns to uh, professional jobs. And yet, we do not have a growth in those jobs. Okay? And you can see that in the era of this hyper -com competition, this is some data that I found really interesting coming out of Union Public Service Commissions, which is basically all the government public service exam um, results and reports. And what you see is that the number of people okay, uh, who take uh, this um, exam has uh, increased sharply, that's the orange line, 
Okay. Whereas the proportion of people who are successful in uh, passing the exam and getting into the public service has dropped almost to negligible. This is the era of hyperinflation of uh, credentials that we are seeing, uh, making it very difficult for uh, people to um, translate their education into appropriate jobs. Okay. It's in this context. Um, by the way, on a same level, I thought that this might be quite interesting in the context of what Ashwini Tambay presented. Uh, one used to think that education for men results in better jobs, for women it results in better husbands. Uh, it turns out that actually the number of uh, women who marry men with lower education than themselves has been also rising sharply. Okay? So it's not as if um, the rising education is bringing the same kind of rewards into the marriage market for uh, young women. So the st story here is the educational attainment by itself is not enough to gain the middle class status. Quality of education matters. The public policy focus has been exclusively on getting children into school and through the school. Okay? And it's only in the past decade that we have started paying attention to what people are, uh, and children are learning in schools and what it means for their future success. What mo most of our information about quality of learning has come from the ASAR surveys, the uh, annual status report of education in India. And they have kind of forced us all to focus on poor quality education. Um, among the diasporic community here, many of us are familiar with the work, the wonderful work that Pratham is doing and the reports that they are putting out on uh, learning deficits. The problem is that those reports actually do not distinguish between different social groups. And so we actually don't know enough about the learning deficits by uh, different social categories, religion, caste, class, et cetera. Okay. And that's sort of what I want to focus on as I go along here. Okay. Uh, the data that I'm going to present come from India Human Development Survey. Uh, which is a panel study that began in 2004-05 and uh, continued in 2011-12. Some of the households drawn in this study actually come from an earlier work that Abu Saleh Sharif had done in 1993-94. Okay. Uh, given that there are several people from NIH here, I must gratefully acknowledge the financial support from NIH for this work as well. Um, the survey is basically conducted in 33 states and union territories, um, about 1,500 villages, uh, th nearly 1,000 urban blocks, uh, 40,000 households. And what we did was we administered reading, writing, and arithmetic tests to children uh, who were aged 8 to 11, about 12,000 children. Okay, and that's what I'm sort of going to be talking about as we go along. Okay. The first thing is sort of just to think about social inequalities in educational attainment before we move on to the learning uh, deficits. Okay? And what you see here are uh, data from two rounds of the survey. Uh, red bar shows 2004-05, the orange bar shows 2011-12. And as you can see, for all social groups, um, the mean years of education for both men and women has increased. Okay? Uh, for uh, men among forward caste, the increase was from 10 years to 10 and a half years. For women, actually, there was a much sharper increase for forward caste between 7.7 uh, .7 to 9 years. Okay? However, we also see that there is a substantial sort of a decline or as we go along socioeconomic spectrum. Uh, the forward castes, uh, both men and women have the highest education. The other backward castes is uh, slightly higher than, uh, slightly lower. Dalits have lower, so do Adivasis and so do Muslims. Uh, and then we sort of see the high education level for other religion, religious groups like Christian Sikhs and Jains. Okay. It's these three groups, Dalit, Adivasi, and Muslims that I want to consistently focus in my, on in my uh, talk as we go along. You will also see 
the, the education for men in pretty much every group is consistently higher than that for women. Uh, but for women in um, Dalit, Adivasi, and Muslim categories, the um, education level is particularly low uh, in terms of number of years of education completed. The question, of course, is why? What is interesting is that I think much of our discourse has sort of focused on the fact that, oh, it may be that people from this more vulnerable communities do not want to send their children to school. And my answer is that that is absolutely not correct. Every single group sends their children to school. As you can see, if we look at children eight, ages eight to 11, more than 99%, 98% in every single community uh, uh, is in school, including among girls, okay? It's not just boys, it's boys and girls. Every child is pretty much in school at age eight to 11. What happens is this sharp drop off that you see in the orange bars, which is for children ages 15 to 18. And while that drop off happens for every community, it is particularly large for uh, the Muslim and Adivasi men uh, as well as women. Uh, Dalits remain slightly better off. OBCs are even more better, better off comparatively. Okay. So from 99% of Muslim boys being in school okay, uh, at age 15, uh, age 8 to 11, what we see now are um, nearly 60%, uh, sorry, 50%. Let me take it back, nearly 60% who continue in school, whereas the drop for girls is even greater from 99% who were in school to 56% who continue in school. So something happened between this particular age group that led to the school dropout for these children. Uh, as Ashwini Tambe mentioned, adolescence is a sort of an interesting time period when a variety of things go on in people's lives. And yet, I would like to submit that although Muslim girls have the lowest uh, school enrollment rate at age 15 to 18, Muslim boys are not doing that much better, okay? So while gender matters, it seems to be the uh, belonging to particular social categories, Muslims, Dalits, and Adivasis, that seems to be particularly vulnerable. And that is something that we need to pay a particular focus on, whether it is boys or girls. It is possible that the higher dropout rate for teenagers amongst Dalit Adivasin Sikh Muslims is due to socioeconomic disadvantages. Economically forward class is, economically speaking, forward caste and other minority religions like Sikh, Christian and Jains are the most advanced followed by OBCs and Muslims, and then Dalits and Adivasis. However, economic disadvantages that lead to uh, children dropping out of school should not necessarily result in learning disparities while children are still in school. What do we know about the learning disparities? Well, what we did was we gave reading, writing, and arithmetic test to the kids uh, using the same test that Asar has been giving, very simple tests. As you can see, um, you know, we ask children first to read out uh, words. If they can read out words, we ask them to read short paragraphs and then what we call story, but it's basically just this one long paragraph, okay? Uh, if they can't, if can't read the words and we drop down and ask them to read out the letters, if they can't read out the letters, we identify them as not being able to recognize letters at all. Same thing with respect to math. math. Uh, children are asked to recognize numbers, carry out very short subtractions, uh, two-digit subtractions, and um, carry out divisions uh, with some sort of a carry-forward requirement. Very simple tests. 8 to 11, according to the insert, uh, uh, all children should be able to do that. Okay. However, what we see is that not all children are able to do it. And particularly the deficiency in learning test performance uh, is located in Dalit, Adivasi, and Muslim children. 
you may find it a little bit hard to follow this particular graph on your screen or if you are reading you know listening on phone you may not be able to see it well so let me just identify that what we find is that this blue graph which is about being able to do the blue bar which is being able to perform the best on the reading test okay is the highest among forward cast children among the forward cast children uh, roughly about 50% are able to read a short story uh, as opposed to uh, among the muslim and adivasi children which is mm, close to you know mm, instead of 50% it is a sort of just short of um let me see what did i say uh, in, instead of 50% it's sort of maybe 22% okay same it, it applies to both girls and boys very similar deficiencies for both girls and boys in able to read uh, this very simple short story uh, particularly for children who come from dalit adivasi and muslim communities uh, with adivasis being the most behind in the skill development uh, with dalits and uh, muslims sort of being just a little bit above them with respect to basically even with rising education levels which i showed you earlier on we actually see no improvement in inequalities in reading skills the bars the yellow and the orange bars the, the red bars are 2045 the same test being given to these children uh, in the same age group children getting the same test in 2011 12 and the disparities are pretty much similar there are very few differences and even the slight difference that you might see just has to do with sort of sampling error so education enrollment has improved okay uh, learning performance has not and the disparities between different socio economic groups in learning performance have not changed at all we i won't go into great details on statistical analysis here but even when we sort of control for a variety of factors such as a uh, place of residence parents education whether they are urban or rural children whether there is household assets um, what's the household income uh, and so on the learning disparities persist and continue to show the same kind of differences with particularly the dalits and muslim children particularly staying behind adivasis uh, uh, catch up a little bit when we take into account their parents education and place where they are living but nonetheless um there are there remain stark differences in reading tests uh, reading outcomes for these children we see similar differences in mathematical skills so what you're seeing is very interesting okay social inequalities in education are deeper than we recognize we have consistently focused so far on who goes to school who continues in school we have not focused on what's happening within schools which whatever um, i'm sorry i got somehow cut off in here uh, are you able to hear me now yes yes no um so what we are seeing is basically the social disparities uh in education go beyond just progressing through one level of schooling to the next it's also what they are learning in class and i can't stress again um the enough the connection between sort of the adolescent development that ashwini tambe talked about and what it feels like to be a student who is not learning in the class okay um i i've been doing quite a few qualitative interviews and when we kind of give this test to children you can see in the child's eye you know you know that he knows that he doesn't know what he should be able to do he's really sad about it he's ashamed about it um and feeling really vulnerable that you know i should be able to do this much simple things and i can't okay um 
Every child wants to be able to read and write and perform well in school. When they can't do it, and when you can see those differences consistently happening in certain socioeconomic groups, okay, um, it's very clear that our schools are leaving some children behind. Okay, I should say it's very easy to fall in the trap of blaming the victim. It's easy to say these children come from school, uh, and, and I have been told this by many teachers. Okay, it's easy to say, oh, these children come from families where parents are not educated, parents don't value schooling, and hence, you know, they don't pay attention and they're not doing well in school. Okay, it's very easy to blame these children, and yet it's important that we need pay some attention to the processes that might be leading to these kids falling behind. After all, it's the job of the school to teach these children. It's not, you know, if first generation learners are actually the ones who should be getting more attention okay, rather than less attention, um, more praise rather than less praise. And yet, when you look at sort of school processes, we see that there are a variety of ways in which these kids are being left behind. And I would say a lot of blame lies with the way the educational system is structured. There are a number of processes that happen. One is family-based where parental education and motivation influences what happens in terms of um, the way homework is supervised, the way sort of children, uh, parents interact with schools. Well, it's the school's job to make sure that you are not really leaving education of these children to the parents. There are school-based processes such as discrimination and elitism. And there are the processes where schools and family interact. Okay? And you know, increasing privatization of education definitely is something that sort of creates uh, schooling deficiency for children who come from poor families. And I'm not sure that um, a universal education is supposed to be sort of relying so heavily on privatization such as private tutoring and private school education. Let's look at a little bit of sort of uh, differences by different social groups in access to these educational resources. Okay. What we find is that, mm, mm, again, I am showing here graphs and for people listening on phone, uh, I'm showing here graphs where we show the proportion of children who are in private school uh, for different socioeconomic, uh, different social groups, um, forward caste Hindus, OBCs, Dalits, Adivasi, Muslims, and others. I'm also showing the proportion of children who are receiving any private tutoring. And what we find is that for forward caste Hindus, 40% of children are in private schools as opposed to less than 20% among Muslims, uh, very few among Adivasis, less than 10% and uh, near, uh, about 20% uh, for Dalit children. Same thing with private tutoring that the private schools enrollment is much lower. Um, for Muslim children, in fact, actually, the private school enrollment is not nearly as low. There are 30% of the Muslim children who go to private schools. Okay? Uh, but some of it may be because there is a greater concentration of uh, Muslim population in urban India as opposed to rural India. But nonetheless, it remains lower than other so uh, groups which are doing better on uh, education. To me, it's not that everybody should send their children to private school. To me, it seems like what we really need is the improvement of quality of education in government schools. We also see that there are stark differences in uh, by social group in a uh, number of children who have either repeated or failed a class. Okay. Um, although we know that according to the Sarvastik uh, Abhyan, children are not supposed to be held back. Uh, about 5% of the children from uh, forward caste Hindus and OBC families were held back as opposed to 8% from Dalit, 9% from uh, Adivasis and 5% uh, the children from the Muslim families. There are also differences in parent and school interactions where increasingly parent participation in school via parent-teacher association uh, is seen as a way by which parents manage to interact with schools and um, the results sort of flow into greater teacher attention to their children, greater match between school expectation and parent behavior. 
And what we find is that parent-teacher associations uh, seem to be dominated uh, by participation from uh, more privileged groups rather than Dalit, Adivasi, and Muslim children. Again, I remember doing some qualitative interviews around Jabalpur, and one of the parents basically told me that, you know, they don't want us to be part of, and again, sorry, I should apologize that the parent was both um, somebody who had only finished uh, primary school and came from a Muslim community. And he basically, told me that, look, uh, schools really don't want us to participate in parent-teacher association. If we do, we will ask difficult questions. And so they start making up these rules that the P uh, PTA uh, president can only be someone whose child has, um, you know, very high marks, so who is number one, two, or three in the class. And since our children never make it there, uh, uh, we don't get to be leaders in the PTA association. I have no idea where that particular rule came from or you know, how it was being enforced, but it's one of the ways in by which um, parents are excluded from full participation in what happens within the school. And those parents often tend to be the ones who come from more vulnerable communities. We were asked by, we asked parents, um, you know, over the last one month, your child, did he receive any praise for from teacher, you know, did you get a note telling you that the child was doing well in school? Uh, did the teacher, when you went to pick up the child, uh, the teacher told you that the, your son is, or daughter are doing very well? Okay. And again, what we find is that 38% of forward caste um, Hindus and 48% uh, of other minority religion parents said that the children had been praised in the last one month, as opposed to less than a quarter children from Dalit, Adivasi, and Muslim communities. We also find, and now I want to change the topic a little bit and kind of bring us back to thinking about what might happen going forward, given the pandemic and its impact on um, school schooling of children. As you know, uh, schools in India have now been closed for nearly 18 months, okay, and uh, they will continue to be closed at least until October. Um, distance education has been uh, hit and miss at best. Uh, my colleagues in um, NCER in New Delhi have been doing telephone surveys around the Delhi National Capital Region. And what they find is less than 40% of the children have received any online education at all. Almost no one um, seems to have had any interaction with the schools the, in that teachers have called them up, you know, parents have to sort of take an initiative, make sure that uh, they uh, get WhatsApp links so that the children can watch the videos. And the online education has truly been hit and miss at best. Parents who are able to help their children do this, okay, themselves, are sort of handicapped in many ways. And the handicap for the parents in digital literacy is particularly great among these vulnerable communities. Um, among adults aged 26 to 30, okay, 27% um, of men and 12% of women from forward caste have ex are able to use computer at all. And 31% of men and 14% of women from forward castes are able to use internet either via mobile or their computer. Okay, And this is all 2012 data, but I'm pretty sure uh, some of the disparities would be continuing. Uh, compared to 27% men in you know, forward caste communities, only 7% of the men in, in among Dalits and 12% among Muslims are able to uh, use computers. Uh, for women, the number is even smaller, 3, 4, and 5% among the Muslim and Adivasi communities. This digital inequality in parental generation okay, uh, is likely to widen uh, the able, ability to get uh, academic input during the, this particular lockdown period. And so I think we're going to come up with a perfect storm. Okay, We're going to sort of see that there were children who were left behind anyway. These are the same children who come, whose parents have been sort of left behind from the digital generation. 
And as the schools have closed and the education is being delivered online, uh, these are the same children who are probably not getting uh, the kind of educational inputs that their um, more advantaged peers to. So where we are is we basically have rising um, returns to education in the labor market. We have tremendous inequalities in both educational attainment and skill development for different social groups. And we have social situation that uh, is difficult at best for every child, but particularly difficult for children whose parents have and are not able to help them uh, deal with sort of uh, manipulate digital devices in order to get whatever school lessons are being given. It seems that this is the time to think about okay, where one might go next over the next three, four, five months in terms of preparing um, for um, catch up education and make up uh, education for some of these children who have been left behind. Otherwise, all we can see is a whole generation where there will be incredibly wide disparities in um, learning outcomes. Learning outcomes then sort of flow into uh, school enrollment and conti school continuation, ability to get into college. And we may end up with a long-term inequalities, which are even wider than what we have seen so far. Thank you. Let me end here and turn it over to Rakesh Basant, and I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sanande, and thank you very much to the uh, organizers of uh, this event. It's a pleasure to be here and a privilege. Uh, while I was listening to Sanadi's very interesting uh, presentation, I was reminded of a story which my PhD advisor used to tell us. Uh, and I, I, I was reminded of, the, of that story because I thought what I'm going to do after Sanadi's presentation is something similar to what the boy in that story did. And the story, so I'll start with that small story. The story is about a boy in school, uh, and we're talking about learning outcomes. And he's a lazy boy. He doesn't want to study much. He wants to play. Uh, so his parents say that you have to learn essays to write for your exam. And they ask him to do three or four essays, but he decides to only learn one essay. And he says, I'll learn an essay on a cow. And as luck would have it, uh, when the exam happens, the uh, teacher asks him to write, a, write an essay on a coconut tree. And this boy was smart enough to come up with something which was interesting. So he said there was a coconut tree um, in a very nice, beautiful place, and a cow was tied to the coconut tree. And the rest of the story was his own story about the cow, which he had learned. And I feel I'm going to do something similar uh, because I, I have not done much in the area of learning outcomes. I've been looking at uh, attainment. So I will <clears throat> share my screen. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, with uh, this transition that I'm going to make from uh, the coconut tree to the cow, I will be able to make some useful uh, can you see the screen? No, I think the spotlight is still on, <clears throat> Dr. Desai. So if someone could change the spotlight to... Uh, I think, yeah. Can uh, you see the screen? Yeah, yes. yes. Thank now. you. Thank now. you. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so I'm hoping that this uh, transition that I'm trying to make uh, connecting the coconut tree to my cow story uh, is would be still be relevant, and hopefully in this transition that I make, I'll be able to build on the role of parental education that Sonalde has spoken about, the family school interaction that was mentioned, the discrimination that happens uh, in school and the associated elitism, and uh, <clears throat> based on that, I towards the end I want to 
mentioned based on pers personal experience as well as what some data that I have looked at, uh, that some of these factors persist uh, even when one looks at higher education. And <clears throat> in, in this persistence, you figure out that there are links between attainment in higher education and learning outcomes in school. And so now they actually towards the end mentioned that uh, specifically the learning outcomes, uh, poor learning outcomes in school can result in uh, cascading effect, people not going to college and therefore their learning potential declines dramatically. And, <clears throat> and lastly, I will talk uh, some personal experiences about how these learning outcomes affect uh, even uh, institutions like God, which are probably the most elite institutions in our country. Uh, <clears throat> so let me start with some numbers. Uh, this is the only slide which has some, uh, some uh, graphs. So what I have done here is I have looked at the participation of different social religious groups uh, in higher education, right? And the <clears throat> different, different categories are looked at separately. So if you look at the first cluster, which is which belongs to Hindu scheduled castes, what it tells you is that if you take the share of population in the age group of 17 to 29 years, uh, Hindu scheduled castes have a share of 18.6 percent. So in this uh, population, 17 to 29 age group, their share is 18.6 percent. And if the participation in higher education is uh, somewhat equitably distributed, one would expect that their uh, studying, if the share in currently studying in the same age group would be somewhere close to 18%, 18.6% as the share of the population. But that's not correct. The share of, uh, share of uh, those studying currently in college uh, is 11.4%. So there is a deficit of 186 to 11.4%. But what we found quite interesting when I started to look at this data was that only about 10.9% is the share of the, this age group population which is for Hindu SC, which is eligible to go to college. That is uh, only 10 point, only about 11% uh, uh, SCs uh, were actually uh, eligible to go to college. And as soon as I re you realize that a bulk of the Chirukas children have not crossed the school threshold and therefore they can't go to college, uh, then you figure out that the deficits uh, are not very high. Their share in eligible population is about 11% and their share in those who are going to college in this age cohort is 11.4%. So then it's roughly the same. So which effectively means that all those who were able to cross the school threshold were actually also going to college, right? Now, the point which I want to make here is that the <clears throat> learning outcomes have very significant impact on the children's probability or potential to cross the school threshold. Uh, and you can look at this graph later on, I suppose that will be available to you. The key point here is that <clears throat> by the deficits across social religious categories uh, in participation in higher education is very high. If you come, if you look at the entire population in that age cohort, which is likely to go to college. But as soon as you start looking at the population which can go to college because they have crossed the school threshold and therefore eligible, then the deficits uh, decline dramatically. So let me take another example. If you look at the uh, Hindu OBC, uh, their share in this age population is 34%. Their share in people going to college is also almost 34%. And their share who are eligible is also 34%. So uh, there's not much deficit uh, among the OBCs if you look at this particular graph. Which, but the same is uh, not true when you look at OBCs, uh, Muslim OBC, Muslim, Muslim general, and uh, SC, Hindu SCS, ST, you still find that there is a significant gap between the share in population and the share who is eligible and currently going to college. So that's the point that I <clears throat> want, want to build upon a little more. 
Now, as I said, if you have very high dropout rates among the marginalized uh, population, it becomes a major reason for lower attainment because they are not eligible. And we've already mentioned that. But as soon as you recognize the eligibility issue, the deficits decline dramatically across uh, different social religious groups. And therefore, crossing the school threshold uh, becomes very significant for large segments across all the marginalized categories, because that seems to be the driver for uh, <clears throat> creating those deficits across uh, different social religious groups. So if we are able to ensure that most of the people school across the school threshold, the inequalities in participation in higher education would automatically go away if we believe in the numbers that we have seen so far. Now, over and above the eligibility issue. If you start controlling for other factors like gender, uh, location that is urban and rural, their economic status, uh, the per capita expenditure group, and parental education, uh, once you do that, then the <clears throat> uh, disadvantages that uh, the marginalized groups have decline even further. I mean, if you look at the graph that uh, Sonal there had shown um, for uh, after controlling for uh, parental education, gender, and so on, something similar happens exactly. Something similar happens for uh, the propensity to participate in higher education once you control for uh, these uh, other factors. And that is that the deficits among the marginalized groups decline, which means that if they have similar uh, conditions of location, economic status, and parental education, they will be very similar. Uh, have the same kind of participation as the other groups. Uh, <clears throat> the most interesting thing that we found in our data analysis was that parental education was the most important positive factor affecting the probability to participate in higher education. Even after you control for economic status, location, gender, um, and so on, uh, parental education was the uh, most important uh, variable affecting uh, a child's participation, a, a, a student's participation in higher education. Uh, and which is a very result which is very similar to what Sunal they just showed us that parental education affects uh, learning outcomes because homework happens, you have sort of support mechanisms at home are very critical. And these support mechanisms you carry you through to uh, the higher education as well. So the the same set of factors seem to be affecting uh, participation in higher education, and same set of factors must be, are affecting uh, the learning outcomes, and therefore continuing uh, in school education. So, in order to get out of the trap of low learning outcomes resulting in dropouts, uh, which means that you're not eligible to go to college, and therefore you will not go to college, and then that same cycle will uh, <clears throat> continue. Uh, the, the only way out is to somehow enhance eligibility. And Sanal, they talked about privatization versus good uh, universal education in public schools, something which hopefully some questions will be asked. Now, the last thing which I want to speak about a bit is on, on the issue of whether these learning outcomes that Sanal, they spoke about in school education, uh, do these inequalities persist? Uh, once you go to uh, higher education as well. Now, there's a person called Weisskopf who has done a lot of work on positive discrimination and affirmative action. And he has argued that any affirmative action that you <clears throat> undertake, particularly quota-based affirmative action, uh, its efficacy depends on how homogeneous uh, <clears throat> the community which is being benefited is. And what is the likelihood of the a person who's benefiting from this uh, affirmative action of being successful? Now, if you bring in somebody through any kind of affirmative action, whether it is quota or scholarships or whatever, if that person uh, is not able to do well after getting the admission, the stigma of belonging to a category of people who don't want to study, they are not motivated, the kind of things that Sunal they spoke about 
will persist. So Weisskopf argued that you need to have a situation where uh, the chances of them doing reasonably well in school uh, it is high. Otherwise, stigmatization would persist. Now, what do you do uh, to ensure that the chances are high? And he argued that you have to have significant human and financial support, that you need to have uh, a lot of effort put in by the teachers and the other systems which are in place in the, in, in the institution, educational institution, and of course, provide financial support for them to uh, deal with the uh, various expenses that you have to <clears throat> incur if you're in, in, in uh, education. So, <clears throat> so some of these things happen in a place like ours as well. Um, there are what we call preparatory programs for those who are considered to be not up to the mark in math skills or communication skills or whatever, and there are scholarships, right? Now, <clears throat> in spite of those efforts, I'm not saying that the, those are the best kind of efforts that we put in, but there are some efforts that are put in in our institution to ensure that those who come in through affirmative action, uh, now you have OBC as C's and ST's, because Muslims are not part of of that, but Muslim OBCs come in. Uh, <clears throat> but despite these efforts, uh, we struggle uh, to achieve uh, a situation where the inequalities and in learning outcomes um, is <clears throat> low. Right now, in our institution, uh, nobody actually knows that the student belongs to a reserved category or not. I mean, we do not share that information with everybody, with anybody. Now, as a result, what happens is that if in a class, a section of the students is not doing well, they're getting bad grades, uh, the rest of the class starts to correlate that with affirmative action. So there is a, a peculiar kind of stigmatization for all those who are not performing well uh, in class. The assumption being that those who have come through affirmative action are necessarily bad. So the stigma uh, <clears throat> attached to affirmative action of the people who come through uh, that process uh, gets uh, <clears throat> processed in a, in a very kind of a peculiar fashion. The other implication of this process is that uh, in, our, in our courses, you have these individual component where, of course, all of us have to study and so on and prepare for classes and exams and so on, a large amount of work and learning happens through groups. Now, if I'm not performing well, uh, the chances of somebody else picking me up as a group member uh, becomes less, right? So if I don't do well in the first term, the chances that somebody will pick me up to be part of his or her group in the second term declines. So as a result, you, you, over time, you observe a phenomenon that people who are not doing well increasingly become a group of their own. They are not getting exposed to students who are doing better. And the process, the group learning um, processes that we talk a great deal about at our institution uh, gets <clears throat> Uh, adversely affected because group formation processes get affected by the grades you get and 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 and, and often uh, the people who are not doing well are people who come from uh, these marginalized groups uh, <clears throat> so the other interesting phenomenon that i have observed as a teacher is that we figure out at the time of the interview and given their scores that they you need maths maths uh, support or you need communication support. So we recommend that you come for the preparatory program. And what we've observed is that since it is not compulsory, uh, many people who are not uh, equipped to deal with our coursework as they uh, on the run, they do not come for the preparatory program because they feel that they will get stigmatized through this participation process. Um, because you came for a preparatory program, there must be something wrong with you, and you must be associated with some kind of preparatory action. 
and that <clears throat> creates a, a, a vicious cycle which affects learning processes adversely. And as a result, many of the people who come from the marginalized communities, their learning outcomes are, are, not, are not, not as good. And these are, as Sunalde said, these are based on qualitative interactions with students and have not done any kind of detailed exercise. Uh, <clears throat> one last thought that I had was that just like in our campus, uh, the group learning gets adversely affected because you do not have a critical mass of students who are reasonably good and who are interacting with each other on a continuing basis to bring everybody up. Uh, it's possible that something similar is happening in villages where the cohorts of marginalized group students is, are so small that their group learning processes get, get adversely affected and they, they are not able to get out of uh, this rut of low performance, low participation kind of a thing because uh, despite the fact that many of the parents may have got some support through affirmative action uh, and then supported their parents, so supported their children. Um, so I will stop here. Thank you. Uh, I think I've taken a little more time than I was given. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Hello. Gee, so that's so nice of you, uh, all three, you know, so revealing and somewhat depressing scenario of this inequality. Quality. Um, really was quite uh, informative, and I hope that others have learned and um, take messages home, home messages for introspection and all those. And now we go for the question and answer session, and I invite, uh, uh, okay, before that, we are always do for the coming Saturday. It is a draft poster, which is not a poster yet, but this is what we are going to do. Um, Professor Dani Shekhbal will be moderating that and he, as he does every month. And Shelly Kapoor is our performer singer for Ghalib, uh, looking back at, back at Ghalib and his musical footprints.